We have uh, tonight uh, Tom V6 Zulu Quebec talking with us about VHF propagation effects from the rise of cycle 25. Uh, take it away, Tom. First of all, we've been on the air since 1963 and on VHF 100% uh, of the time. So I've uh, spent a fair amount of time uh, wandering around Canada and the world and uh, dragging as a rule with my uh, VHF handheld as well. So I've had an opportunity to speak to some interesting DX up close and personal. Uh, as a geoscientist, I actually worked in the field for a long time for the federal and then the provincial governments, which didn't require me to be licensed. Starting in 2001, I found it convenient to go into consulting, and so I've been a licensed geoscientist since then. I started out with uh, Pan American Petroleum, which old timers will remember became Amoco, and uh, was introduced to geophysics there, and in particular, uh, the digital signal processing of seismic data. And I've been poking around at that ever since. Uh, gravity and magnetics came along with it when I got into the mining industry in the early 2000s. It has been um, a very interesting um, period and a very interesting career. So I'll go through the outline briefly. Uh, and we'll skip the abstract. You can read that later if you really want to, but uh, and jump right into the issues to be addressed. Uh, this evening, I've uh, decided that we'll have a look at uh, tropospheric um, um, issues and uh, tropospheric oper uh, operation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the exosphere because lately I've got into meteor scatter, uh, but also auroral refraction. And uh, some of you may have been playing with that if you're into weak signal work. From there, we'll go into the ionosphere mess with the D layer for a while because the D layer can do all kinds of interesting things like ionoscatter um, can allow you access to the F, uh, F layers, F1 and F2 through sudden ionospheric disturbances. We'll talk about ionospheric storms of which we have had plenty in the last week or two and uh, just touch on polar cap absorption events, which are kind of the opposite. Uh, sporadic E will cover. Um, F layer will just bounce, <laughs> will just bounce off the F2 layer and talk about uh, the kinds of solar phenomena that affect propagation. Uh, we don't normally associate uh, normal ionospheric issues with uh, uh, VHF propagation, but in fact, indirectly or indirectly, it does uh, very much govern what's going on. Then we'll have a look at cycle 24 to 25 observations and some speculation on where it's going to go. Um, then uh, we'll talk about those possible solar effects on VHF propagation. Mess a bit with some observations that I've made over the last week while we've been putting this talk together and review a little data. Then hopefully we'll have time for some fulsome discussion on uh, what we can do and where we can go next. Here's the abstract, which is uh, a lot of baffle gab, and uh, since you're recording this, uh, you'll be able to have a look at it later. We're going to touch on most of those topics as we carry along this evening. Here's where we're at. Cycle 24, which was a real bummer for most of us. It didn't really um, amount to a a hill of electrons, and we went through the longest period of uh, low activity since the 1830s. So it was quite disappointing for a lot of us. But then suddenly, uh, last fall, things started to spike up literally. And as of uh, yesterday, we were up there between 125, 150 solar flux units, F10.7 centimeters. Um, which is why we have a hole in one of our uh, ham bands, incidentally, because that's the one that's monitored at Penticton. 
is recalculated and shipped around the world. Um, and that's the one that really got me going on, on propagation back in, when I was in high school, because um, the International Geophysical Year of 1957 turned out to be the strongest uh, uh, solar uh, uh, cycle in uh, 200 years, and uh, a lot of interesting things were happening. Unfortunately, I missed out on both, most of it because I didn't get uh, licensed to a little later. Now we should be looking at the structure of the atmosphere. Yes. With VHF, we can play with the entire structure of the atmosphere. On HF, we're pretty well limited to what's going on in the stratosphere. And in my uh, career, I've spent an awful lot of time worrying about tropospheric phenomena since uh, I've worked as a hydrologist and a hydrogeologist for most of the last 40 years. The troposphere is where most of the common uh, VHF propagation goes on, and we'll be coming back to it almost uh, uh, constantly. Uh, when we're dealing with the troposphere, it's line of sight as a rule, but at the tropopause is where ducting can occur. And that's when really interesting stuff begins. If there is no uh, tropospheric ducting going on at any given time, and we have uh, fairly large, um, fairly large um, uh, solar flux uh, numbers, and also if we also adjacent with that have A numbers and K numbers that are at the top of the heap then the D layer becomes our friend. Uh, you can, uh, at the stratopause between the stratosphere and the mesosphere, um, the D layer can be um, uh, a very useful element in um, modeling scatter, but also in refraction. And a certain amount of ducting can also go on there. And I'll talk about that a little later when we get into meteor showers because I've seen some stuff this last month that uh, has me really interested again as to how the heck it happened. And finally, there's aurora in the thermosphere, which uh, is sort of the outer limit of air as we recognize air to be. The red line over here is the uh, temperatures that are commonly found in each of the spheres. And when they invert is when you get uh, some interesting propagation opportunities. And that too we'll deal with a little later. The thermosphere is uh, the big inversion because it uh, runs between 90 and 1500 Celsius, much warmer than anything else. The in intervening layers we talked minus big minus numbers but once we get above 85 kilometers the atmosphere becomes much thinner much smaller in mass and that uh, is where i think interesting things like the aurora start to occur above that is an indeterminate element called the exosphere and that's where the international space station and in the old days when we had them, space shuttles uh, have ruled the roost at that 600 to 100,000 kilometers out. And after that, the only thing you're going to run into is the moon. The um, boundary between the thermosphere and exosphere is also where a lot of satellites, the LEOs, hang out. And uh, if there are any uh, lower Earth orbit uh, satellite junkies in the crowd. Um, that's that's where your toys work the best. And as Mr. Musk discovered the hard way, sometimes the exosphere gets a lot more air into it. In other words, the thermal, the thermal uh, break uh, becomes a place where, believe it or not, Satellites can get dragged back down to the atmosphere and burned up in short order. That happened to something like 60 to 80 of his um, of his galaxy. 
Let's now talk a bit about tropospheric propagation in the line of sight mode. Um, recently, which was about nine, um, two years, we uh, bought a trailer and most of my portable operations have gone on there ever since, including, of course, the ever present um, line of sight VHF antenna. Prior to that, uh, I did a lot of backpacking. And in the last, the second to last solar cycle, one that peaked out around 1991, um, I discovered QRP, mixed it in with my backpacking operations, which I've always been fascinated by, and um, combined the two. So Field Day 1991 found me in Yoho Park. And there's the, um, the uh, VHF system I used for talking back to town by using a line of sight mode called knife edge refraction over um, um, mountain ridges. And it worked, and it worked quite well. This particular trick, uh, if you can make out the faint yellow line, was about 100 kilometers long. Started and ended in the vicinity of uh, well, actually, it ended at the Magpie and Stump in Banff, waiting for Maria to come and pick us up and take us back to our cars up in, at Lake Minnewanka. So we started Minnewanka, went over the Elmer Pass, um, over uh, a place where there are no trails. We uh, uh, just uh, bushwhacked it uh, down into the uh, upper 40 mile creek area around uh, just a beautiful piece of real estate that's owned most of the time by grizzly bears. The um, Flint's Park area I camped there for several nights actually and worked some DX and then uh, off to Sawback Lake where we had some tremendous trout fishing. And so it went for the better part of uh, two weeks, uh, having one adventure after another. One of the major parts of the um, expedition was hamming. And uh, you'll note that the time, this is daylight saving times, where I did most of my um, hamming was in the evenings. So I was able to take advantage of uh, some ducting, uh, some uh, line of sight, uh, some more uh, refraction over ridges, and uh, talk to quite a few people. Um, a key day, the 6HWY, it was just open then. This was the 29th of July, 1991, from uh, Stony Creek campsite which is the furthest north I think you can still get in the Cascade Fire Road by bicycle. But this time we didn't, well, we did have bikes in the early part. That's where we had our food cache for the balance of the trip. Always found it useful to have uh, a good resupply point somewhere about halfway around the loop. Um, got weather reports uh, from uh, some of the local hams. And uh, the 6GLR, Glenn, who has been a silent key for many years now, was with me through the entire trip and um, passed messages uh, to our families to let them know that the bears didn't get us, despite what we had been warned by my grandmother before we left, but also to just sort of generally keep in touch. We had some nice chats over this. Um, also had an opportunity to work people who were mobile on uh, Highway 93 and Highway 1. You'll see uh, the 6 glr show up there quite often. He uh, was very good about waiting for me and um, being uh, very, um, very patient about getting some of these messages through. Uh, Mystic Lake, there's another call sign you will be familiar with, E6CID. He, he was uh, near Eisenhower Junction at the time. And also um, 
his climbing buddy Claude was uh, was along as well, coming from the other direction, I guess. And so it went for the uh, the balance of the trip. We uh, while we were waiting for Maria to come uh, come and pick us up on the third uh, of August, um, I had the opportunity to talk to a few people on two meters as well. So tropospheric propagation can be very, very helpful. I think it's quite possible that we did a little bit of um, a little bit of, of uh, tropospheric uh, ducting as well. And um, one of the things uh, that makes VHF so interesting is that you never know where you're going, your signal is going to go and how it's going to get there. Ducting is uh, pretty well um, governed by uh, temperature inversions. And in the zone that most of us work, 6, 2, and 70 centimeters, and some, I guess, are into 1296. Um, please excuse the little yellow thing there. I had a, a note in there and never got around to taking it out, but two meters is in this zone. Um, you need an inversion depth of uh, 1,000 meters, a kilometer high, to get anywhere on six meters. If it's uh, around 100 meters, then all of the ham bands in the lower part of the UHF uh, spectrum um, can use that mode quite effectively. This is one of the off-the-wall things that, uh, that I've been following for quite some years now. The tropopause, the area between the troposphere and the stratosphere, has some a rather interesting weather. In fact, we've been enjoying it for the last three days here. And I hadn't, I didn't get a chance to get on the air, so I don't know if anybody managed to work any um, tropospheric stuff while we were in this zone here. Um, I have read that uh, some of our colleagues have been working these. Um, but have become known as atmospheric rivers that come out of the intertropical convergence zone along here. It's actually just north of the equator. And I always found that kind of interesting because southern hemisphere weather mirrors what's happening in the northern hemisphere. The high temperature or high pressure uh, system inversion is probably the most effective. The bad news is there's almost nobody to talk to in that right angle zone where our signals are spurting. Uh, and the other direction isn't much help either. Occasionally you get lucky and you can, uh, depending on where the, uh, the jet stream, and that's what you see here in these bright red colors high velocity zone. When it gets a little further north, sometimes we can work people in VY0 and KL7. Right now, as we speak, this is where that, uh, the, uh, why, where one of those high pressure ridges is holding sway. And by rights, we should be making uh, good contacts through, I mean, North Central British Columbia all this lightning activity that's being bottled up by the jet stream also should be making for some interesting propagation effects as well, possibly poking us into the um, uh, the and the same thing to the east. Except once again, the best zone for radio transmission is one where there's almost nobody in the landing area. I think you're all familiar with this diagram. Uh, this was taken at uh, 1800 Zulu today. And uh, we've got a lot going on. We've got some major aurora happening, and it's just well into the peace country. Uh, in our zone, the sub aurora, uh, we're also seeing black radio blackouts. I was listening to HF this afternoon, and uh, it was totally blacked out. I, was, I couldn't see a darn thing. 
We also are having a lot of, of particulate activity. The, um, if I can make this a little bigger, um, electrons are plunging fairly deep into our atmosphere. And uh, it's still in the normal range, as you can see, they're, they're yellow, but um, they look to be on the rise. So those are the things that the magnetosphere is interesting for, uh, for and that's the activity that's happening in the zone. And that's interesting because if the rural zone moves further south, and Japan and, and um, Siberia come into play, uh, you can work some JAs and some UA8s. Although I don't know if they are still on the air or not, but certainly the JAs are. And it looks like this is going to persist into the weekend. It won't be quite as severe, but that's a good thing. So a big aurora also gives us a big noise level. And as far as electron fluence is concerned, we should be seeing, well, it looks like we kind of peaked out and it's going to back off. So that means the lower noise in the HF zone and also in six meters, but it's still high enough. We should, might just get some decent uh, six meter activity. And here's the reason why. That's called a coronal mass ejection. And uh, when one of those uh, babies bounces off the ionosphere, things really light up. It may also, though, deepen the D layer. That means absorption, which means not much fun for anybody. But a dense D zone can be from a um, VHF, UHF perspective. And the biggie should be here in a, uh, on Saturday or Sunday. Now, there are two things to remember about geomagnetism. The first is, if none of that happened, if you had a K of zero, then the geomagnetic map is going to look a lot like this. And one of the interesting things about it is, of course, the geomagnetic lat latitudes get pushed further south in the north because the north magnetic pole is right about there. But the south magnetic pole does the reverse and it's right about there, somewhere between South America and Africa, which distorts the model all the heck. Uh, so when you're thinking transequatorial, the reason we don't see it as a rule is because the uh, geomagnetic latitudes are pushed further south the further east you get from us. And as you go west, um, there's uh, always the possibility of working into Australia or New Zealand. And occasionally, we also have opportunities if one of the polar research st stations in Antarctica has a ham rig along. Of course, the big E is sporadic E. Sporadic E, if you'll notice, looks an awful lot like weather. And in fact, seeing a sporadic E clouds are there, I guess that shouldn't be too surprising. The clouds of sporadic E ride the jet stream like much of the rest of the world's weather. This changes by season. And if you've ever played with sporadic E, you know it's highly and the bad news because nobody else is on the air is that it's mostly in the summertime. Uh, when we're busiest in the winter time, we don't even see it because the sporadic E is in the southern hemisphere. And in the shoulder seasons, spring and fall, there's practically no uh, sporadic E activity at all at our latitude. You'll notice that this um, plane passes through about the same spot in all of these things. So it's associated with that first sag in the northern uh, geomagnetic latitudes 
and the push-up of the southern ones. There's been a lot of geophysical uh, research done recently to try to figure out what's happening there, but it appears that uh, the uh, mold of the Earth is uh, much smaller than we thought it was, and also that um, it is shaped, it's L-shaped rather than uh, a marble. We know that the Earth is an oblate spheroid and that it's wider at the, uh, um, at the equator than it should be, and we wonder if that might have something to do with that. Let's go back to tropospheric ducting since that's a biggie. And we can ride that one into the uh, more populated areas in North America. And it sometimes persists for up to a couple of weeks. Um, I've worked it on six meters. And um, it's just like having stations in central California, Nevada, and our cousins in Montana and Idaho in the shack with us. It's like chatting across town on E. And it's very stable. And that's largely because of uh, weather patterns that, uh, that uh, are the uh, reason why it, it happens in the first place. Another quite stable thing, although it is quite, um, quite um, how would you say, um, iffy, is micrometeorites. MSK-144 has been a great uh, boon to the satellite, uh, the uh, my, uh, meteorite uh, plinking crowd, myself included, and um, strongly recommended it as a, a fun thing to do. But there's only one time of the year when it really works when you have small antennas and low power, and that's in August. And once again, that's the period when we probably have the least ham radio activity. Here's uh, one that I caught the other day. It was a QSO between a UA5 and a Delta Oscar 8. Um, in uh, the Delta Oscar 8 was in K uh, Kilo Charlie 27, which is uh, not a grid we hear a lot of. But most interesting was the pattern on the MSK144 display on my on my uh, computer screen, it shows a very clear double refractive layer, which could explain why we got all the way into central Russia and down into um, Indonesia. So uh, uh, that was one of the really intriguing things that I will leave for discussion when we get to that part of the program. I did have some minimal luck with the Eta Aquarius meteor scatter peak, but we had a minor X-ray burst at the same time, and that produced a three-layer pattern. I didn't get any uh, decodes off that one, but it, it, um, it's one thing that uh, perhaps we should be looking for. It's almost exactly the reverse to the one that got me interested in this in the first place. You can see dark lines uh, if you look really carefully. Where uh, before we had bright lines, see the blue poking through the orange, orange being high intensity and blue being lower intensity. Oh yeah, with the uh, with the decodes, I got lucky in that one. Although they were they were local, so there's also a chance that looking at on that particular day was a um, trop uh, a trop duct. So N7 NWP is a call we see fairly frequently on on meteor scatter. Uh, and in uh, November Delta Zero Bravo as well. I've been calling uh, somebody in um, Argentina, so we also had some trans equatorial. In um, MSK 144 for the uninitiated, uh, these are 
signal bursts and these are pings. So when the meteor shower uh, heats up and, be, and becomes ionized, it, it, it also generates uh, an electromagnetic pulse, which the ping jockeys love. But these longer drawn out bits are, are um, signals somebody's uh, shifting up. <coughs> In this case, um, 12.06, it would have, it was before I got these two decodes here. So another look at that, what looks like signals, but not enough of it got through to be a decoded. It may also have been, seeing as we have a minor x-ray, uh, burst sea level uh, flaring event. Uh, it might also have been natural noise coming from the sun. So here are my observations and conclusions. Cycle 25 looks like cycle 22 did. Um, all the usual VHF, UHF, DX modes will be enhanced over the next two and a half to three years. It looks like cycle 25 will be a good one for weak signal nodes, uh, but we still don't know. It may fizzle or it may be a, a two peaker in the way the last three have been. And it looks to me like MSK 144 is going to be a really good bet for meteor scatter, but also for um, sporadic E and possibly even F2 for all that matter. So with that, before my voice gives out entirely, I'm going to call for questions. Does anybody have uh, some thoughts on my ramblings and uh, what we might be able to use them for? I have a question, uh, Tom. I'm just trying to understand tropospheric uh, ducting. I, I know, I understand, I, I think from my early days of studying, but um, you know, when our radio waves are refracted off of the ionosphere, uh, you know, I can understand how they are refracted through, through charged particles, but it, I'm getting the feeling that tropospheric ducting, are we still talking charged particles or are we talking uh, refraction due to temperature effects? As you know, saying temperature inversion there. Is that, is that what's causing it? It's more of a weather thing rather than as opposed to a charged particle thing? It's likely all three. First of all, there are two different kinds of ducting. The kind that we see around here, uh, which is probably good for out to about 100 kilometers, is next to the ground. And somebody mentioned, um, we should maybe comment on uh, the interaction between groundwater, saturated uh, upper phreatic layer of the soil, and radio propagation. And yes, there is a very, very close association with the two. Uh, the other kind of ducting, oh, and that one uh, surface to essentially a couple of hundred meters is um, uh, a temperature related thing, but also to an air particle and dust particle uh, density thing. And the VHF waves behave like it, they do in the vicinity uh, are of uh, the D layer. So you get you can get bent, uh, but you can't break through. Uh, and one morning, um, when uh, Maria and I were living in Vigerville, I had to get an early flight, so I took off down, or yeah, took off down the highway toward uh, Edmonton International at Miskew, and we were able to, on um, just handhelds, chatter back and forth all the way from Vegreville to Miskew, which is about 150 kilometers, and it was uh, loud and clear the whole way. So uh, with uh, at most five watts, we had some very good DX. Um, she had uh, our home, um, our home uh, antenna uh, on her end, and I had the uh, five eighths whip on 
defender of the car at my end. Uh, we had that uh, happen a, a number of times, but that was probably the best one of the lot. Now the atmosphere ducting can occur at practically any level through the um, entire, okay. Uh, that kind of ducting can occur at any, any level here, but it most commonly occurs along the tropopause, the zone in between the troposphere and here. And that is when the um, uh, temperature trace does the reverse from what it's showing here. At around 50 kilometers, it goes the other way. It gets much warmer, much colder, pardon me. And the near surface layer gets much warmer. So you can expect that kind of ducting to be common during the summertime when you have surface heating and stratospheric occurring. Um, also, um, it's where, remember these little guys over here? Well, a lot of the meteor shower um, outcomes are little pellets of iron. And I've seen these in every geological zone that I've looked at from the Precambrian to the recent. So I have a sneaky hunch that those guys, well, at the time they hit that uh, tropopause or the stratospheric, mesospheric equivalent, they're still pretty hot and may even have uh, an ionization uh, corona around them. This is speculation, but we can speculate in this environment here. And it's something well worth uh, keeping an eye on. Again, going back to MSK 144, if you start to see those streaks appearing, I got a sneaky hunch that it's because you have some kind of dust floor and uh, regular meteor shower pellets happening um, further up uh, the uh, atmospheric column. Now, going back to the ground, the thing that makes a good RF ground at all frequencies is uh, as big an uh, amount of copper as you can stuff into the ground. And the main, main reason it works is because it interacts with groundwater. So what you're really doing is completing the circuit through the surface accumulations of water. And if you're in an area that has really poor groundwater, it makes for really good antenna conditions. Um, in Vegreville, we had the really good ground conditions, which the farmers hated. It's called solenexic soils. In here, actually, pretty good groundwater, uh, right down to about 200 meters. So um, it isn't quite as effective here, but as long as you've got lots of copper in the ground and something for it to contact, it works. I've noticed that my HF vertical works like uh, the, the Dickens for CQ Worldwide uh, SSB in October, but by the, the ARRL DX competition comes around in January, it doesn't work with it too. In fact, uh, I've got a dipole up which uh, works much better in midwinter when the groundwater is much deeper and not in contact with my um, my um, copper web under underneath the antenna farm. So uh, there's a fairly complicated answer to a fairly question. Yeah, there are two different kinds of ducts. And we don't really understand the high or the upper one very well. It's still an area of active research. So we'll take what we can get when it occurs. And if I can go back to the, this chart, some of that may be sporadic E, particularly in the wintertime here, which is the summertime in the southern hemisphere. So working Argentina off sporadic E, which is duck soup at that time of the year on HF, may also be possible on six meters and even two. 432, I would, uh, unless you've got extremely high power. If it's extremely high power, you don't worry about sporadic E anyway, because then you can use uh, 
what amounts to anything that will scatter a signal up in the air. And, that, and that's what the BMUs over the horizon radar is all about. Oh, I was just wondering if uh, Tom had any recommendations of where is the best place to go to get a, you know, a, a simple but accurate uh, picture of what the propagation conditions are at any given point in time and what the forecast oh. is. Right. Well, the simplest, easiest is the one that I have up on. This is uh, NRCAN's uh, web page. And um, there's nothing simple about propagation ever. And <laughs> most of the time you get fooled. <laughs> they have an absolutely stunning um, K number. They can go as high as 10. Uh, and uh, a really good uh, CMP sideswiping the atmosphere. And all you get is dead silence. And other times it makes six meters sounds like 20 during a contest. And occasionally, and I've been through a couple of those events too, where two meters wakes up like 20 meters. Um, while uh, my metals um, mining prospecting days, I had to monitor uh, VHF radio, 170 megahertz, day in and day out and all day long. Most of the time it worked just like two meters does. I mean, it should, it is very close to uh, 150 megahertz. But occasionally it would, it would open up and all kinds of commercial travel from all over North America. And uh, when you're uh, 100 kilometers north and west of Peace River, uh, that can be quite spectacular. The local hams up there uh, talk about it quite a bit, and that is when they can routinely work stations in Alaska and the Yukon. And for them, that's a thousand kilometer hike. For us, it's a 2,000 kilometer hike, so we don't see it very often. Yeah, that's great, thanks. I Good news, Space Weather Canada. You can just Google it if you can't remember a yeah. URL. Um, there's uh, most of the space weather that we get access to here comes from the US, of course, but they've got a totally different environment. Um, they don't have to contend with the auroral zone anywhere nearly as much as we do. Mind you, the, that uh, Midwest drip often behaves like Southern Alberta does, but by and large, uh, they've got a much more stable ionosphere and atmosphere than we do. Although they get some Molopaloozas of storms, which uh, gives you the opportunity to work some of those big high pressure inversions. In any event, um, I used to, well, I still use uh, uh, WWV as an ionosphere probe. That's the next thing everybody should know and should do. You know, the maximum usable frequency from which of the five uh, frequencies they transmit on uh, is coming in and how well. For um, VHF, um, FM uh, broadcast is a, a pretty good indicator of um, the zone between six meters and two meters. And someday um, it, there are stations from south of the border that come in better here when I have um, my FM receiver on my VHF antenna. Um, I'm hearing stations from 500 to 1,000 kilometers away. So when you hear that kind of activity in the broadcast band, it's time to also start looking at six meters.